Hey noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and I've been told by one of you that a channel called Scary Cherry has recently put out a video about the ancient Romans and the person in question, thank you so much for letting me know by the way, told me that, oh my gosh, they, they're really mad at this video, they said you've got to make a debunking, but I mean, how bad can it be? All cards on the table, the past has been kind of awful, but the past was so much worse. If I could live at any place in time in history, ancient Rome may be at the bottom of my list. Okay, that means war. Scary Cherry, if I were you, I wouldn't really be worried too much about you visiting Rome. I'd be more worried about Rome visiting you. Just kidding, let's continue. Executions by Beasts. The official name for such an action was Damnatio ad Bestias. Don't say it, Metatron. Don't say it. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to talk about his Latin pronunciation, nothing. You're, you're so pedantic. You're such a pedantic guy. Just stop it. It's just anglicizing. It's nothing wrong with that. He speaks English. He doesn't speak Latin. Not everyone needs to speak Latin. This is not an empire anymore. He probably gives, he gives to charity. He's such a lovely man. He's an outstanding member of society. He pays his taxes. He helps ladies carry out their rubbish every single day. Every day is there. He hates pineapple and pizza. He supports damnatio ad bestias. Final accusative plurals are always long vowels. Okay, I said it. I said it. Maybe cut it. Roman clothing. You could tell what class of a person they were simply based solely on the clothing that they wore. And it wasn't even solely the material of the clothes that could show off your rank, as the very color of your clothing could also provide someone with your status. Yellows, browns, blacks, and black and gray colors indicated poverty amongst the people, and it was such a moniker for them that you wouldn't find someone in the upper classes ever dreaming of adorning those colors. When we talk about colors and clothing in ancient Rome, they do indicate a certain level of economic power. That is true, although the colors you chose are not exactly in the correct order, but it is true as a fundamental concept. They also are connected to a expression code. I'll talk about it in a second. First of all, black is not particularly poor as a tint, and that's the same for all types of colors that weren't faded because they needed several applications, particularly on linen. And the way the Romans obtained black was not that simple. What they did is that they took iron liming and then they mixed it with walnut husk as a mordant. They used black, for example, for the toga pulla, which is a sign of grieving, sobriety, but also worn to express disapproval. Also saying that yellow is a poor color or a color of poverty is incorrect. Uh, we need to look at what shade of yellow we are talking about. For example, when we talk about saffron color, we see that that type of yellow is used for the production of a type of clothing called crocotula, a light tunic worn by Roman women during celebrations in honor of Bacchus, because that color was associated with the god. Yellow was also the color of the mantle of the wife of the flamen, which is a specific type of priest which had the duty of taking care of the sacrificial flames. Now, bright yellow, which the Romans called luteus, was extracted from the plant Reseda and it was used to create the flammeum which was basically the bridal veil during Roman weddings. Once again, not connected to poverty. Greenish yellow which was extracted by the plant Ferula, Ferula, I don't actually know how to pronounce it in English. Ah, pedantic, pedantic Metatron. Was normally associated with femininity and Juvial says that it's not good when men wear it. And one color that we can absolutely associate with poverty, still basing it on Juvial, would be a bluish green. Reds, greens, purples, and blues, and all other bright colors were indicative of being rich. And the only color that was often shared by all classes would be white. Isidoro Sevilla is one of those that connect red with the army. We know that the army would have worn several different types of colors. For your statement that white would have been the most common is also incorrect because in order to get white, they needed to bleach both linen and wool. And the reality is that even though they could do it, and oftentimes the army does wear white, for example, during military parades, the most simple would have been an undyed linen or an undyed woolen tunic. Mouthwash. Now, arguably, and most disgustingly, we have what Romans used for mouthwash. They used urine. That's right, they would get urine from people or animals 
and then use it as a mouthwash to try and brighten their teeth. Which is disgusting, vile, crude, and all that stuff. Alright, so many channels speak about this. I think it's about time to address and debunk this idea that the ancient Romans were using human urine as a sort of mouthwash. This is of course mentioned in Catullus, Strabo, Diodorus Siculus, and a few other authors. But if you do read the actual authors, you'll see that it paints a completely different picture. So let's read it. Catullus from Carme 39. Now you are a Celtiberian in the land of Celtiberia. Whatever each man has urinated, with this he is accustomed in the morning to rub his teeth and gums until they are red, so that the more polished those teeth of yours are, the more urine they proclaim you have drunk. So, he's making fun of the Celtiberians for doing that. Let's see what Diodoro Siculus has to say. They, he's speaking about the Celtiberians once again, consistently use urine to bathe the body and wash their teeth with it, thinking that in this practice is constituted the care and health of the body. Strabo also mentions this but instead connects it to Celtic populations in general and specifically the ones in the Iberic Peninsula. So all in all yes it is mentioned in the sources but no it wasn't the Romans that were doing this and in fact they seem to be very critical of this practice. Blonde hair. In Rome's case if you were a prostitute you had to have blonde hair when you were outside doing your work. Thankfully they didn't force the ladies to dye their hair so they typically got wigs. Now I've seen several channels including top 10 list channels that talk about this idea that a blonde wig would be associated with a prostitute. So you had a prostitute, they had to wear the blonde wig. Well this one is also false and we can read more about it in Ovidius. He does mention a commerce of blonde wigs coming from Germania but he never associates it with uh, prostitutes. It's just a commerce and Roman women liked it and they bought the wigs and that's that. So where does this myth come from? Well it comes from a wrong reading and interpretation of Juvio because he talks about this person Messalina and she is wearing a disguise in the sense that she doesn't want to be recognized so she puts on a blonde wig, goes into the brothel and pretends to be a prostitute. But he does not associate a blonde wig with prostitution. He just says that she's wearing it because she doesn't want to be recognized and the fact that she's pretending to be a prostitute is not a connection to the wig. It's just part of the story. Ancient magic. Given the lack of true science in ancient Rome, there were plenty of people who practiced various forms of magic and tried to use their services for the benefit of all classes. Everyone from the poor that could afford it to the Roman elite that were willing to get their hands on various magical objects or to use oracles to try and predict their future. What this goes to show is that people were willing to believe many things in ancient times because they had no reason not to. This is the one point where I think you are showing a lot of presentism and modernism in the way you interpret the sources. First of all it's important to understand that the Romans divided, and we see this in the sources, magic and religion particularly state religion. We will see, and I'll show you in a second with the sources and the actual accounts, that they spoke very negatively about magic itself, but they would absolutely not put going to the oracle within the box that you just called magic. For a Roman would be religion, so it would be very similar to people today who go to church. For example, the bronze tablets that were used by some people in ancient Rome to cast spell on your enemies or curse them are part of a, a whole system of beliefs that was heavily condemned and persecuted by the full force of the law, uh, for example already in 81 BC, and anyone who would try to do that would be tried as attempted murder. Tacitus defines astrologists the following way. A tribe of men most untrustworthy for the powerful, deceitful towards the ambitious, a tribe which in our state will always be both forbidden and retained. Still from Tacitus we learn. The senate ordered the expulsion of the astrologers and magic mongers from Italy. One of their number, Lucius Pituanius, was flung from the rock. Another, Publius Marcius, was executed by the consul outside the Esculin gate according to ancient usage and at sound of trumpet. Ulpian also talks about this and tells us. Also banned is the crafty and stubborn persuasive fraud of the astrologers. It is not just in modern times that this has been banned, rather it is an old prohibition. It is an old prohibition. He writes in the 2nd century AD but he's talking about an old tradition. In short, there is a decree of the senate dating to the consulship of Pomponius and Rufus that prescribes exiles and property confiscation for astrologers, Chaldeans, soothsayers and all who do similar things, or death if the person is a foreigner. Vomitorium. 
there was actually a belief, amongst many, that ancient Romans had a place called the Vomitorium. It was a place where they would go and vomit to get their food out of their stomachs solely so that they could eat more. The good news is that this is not a real thing. In truth, the vomitorium is an architectural term used to describe the passageway or corridor of an amphitheater. Okay, so you are partially correct and partially wrong with this one in the sense that you are right that there wasn't a specific location called vomitorium which people used to go and throw up and vomit their food after they had eaten. So you're absolutely correct. This is a, is a misnomer, it's a wrong interpretation of that word. But the fact that some Romans, particularly the wealthy one, did do this is mentioned in the sources, so that one isn't a myth. Let's read it. Seneca tells us, They bring together from all regions everything known or unknown to tempt their fastidious palate. Food which their stomach, worn out with delicacies, can scarcely retain, is brought from the most distant ocean. They vomit that they may eat, and eat that they may vomit, and do not even deign to digest the banquets which they ransack the globe. To obtain. So, in the sources by other Romans, they do mention this practice, but it's considered a form of debauchery. In Suetonius we read, He, he's speaking about Claudius, hardly ever left the dining room until he was stuffed and soaked. Then he went to sleep at once, lying on his back with his mouth open, and a feather was put down his throat to relieve his stomach. Suetonius, as he speaks about Vitellius, says, He divided his feast into three, sometimes into four a day, breakfast, luncheon, dinner, and a drinking bout, and he was readily able to do justice to all of them through his habit of taking emetics. Not a myth. Lead paste. One of the more dangerous things they did was going to certain lengths to make sure that their skin appeared to be pale or to give it a rose look, and to get that effect they would put paste on their faces. But not just any paste, a lead paste. That's right, lead poisoning. The fact that some Roman women used products based on sometimes white lead in their cosmetics is mentioned by Ovidius, Pliny and Marshall. However, when you say that they are ignorant of the possible uh, dangers of this is absolutely false because when we read the authors, not only they are fully aware of the toxicity of white lead in their cosmetics, but they even call it a mortal poison. It's in the sources. Pliny calls this a mortal poison. Ovidius calls it poisonous compounds. And this is further proved by the fact that we have someone like Plautus that instead tells us that in order to avoid the toxicity of these sort of elements or ingredients, alternative healthy cosmetics were in fact used, particularly to create this little blush in the cheeks of Roman women that were based on different ingredients that did not involve lead. Not to mention, if that's one of the reasons why you wouldn't want to go and live in ancient Rome, then you should also not want to go and live in 17th century England, since white lead-based cosmetics were still in use there. Yes, there are many who even speculate that the elite using this lead paste, as they did, were once one of the key downfalls of the empire, because so many of the elite kept becoming poisoned by their own hands. The reason why I decided to talk about this is because it's also connected to a larger sort of myth that has been propagated in the 80s by uh, the likes of Jerome Riago, who is a chemist, and he was speaking about this idea of lead poisoning in ancient Rome, not only in connection to cosmetics, but also in connection to the lead piping and water infrastructure and aqueduct, going as far as saying that that's the reason why the Roman Empire fell, because they were all poisoned by lead. But these theories have been debunked bunked and approached and addressed already by these specific classicists who are not only experts and historians but also have a very solid medical background. And since we mentioned the aqueducts, once again if we read Pliny we see that he knows that the lead-based aqueducts were unhealthy for you because he's saying that they use the same white compound and powder to make white marble and therefore it's probably not good for your body and he pushes the idea of using terracotta instead. So yes, they are very aware. Medical treatments. Medicine in the ancient Roman world was pretty bad and there's a very little amount of way that you could get around it. It's true that ancient Rome had great battlefield medicine at times, but that was more about trial and error than anything else. Okay, Roman medicine was anything but trial and error. Completely wrong. Roman medicine was developed as an heir of Greek medicine based on the school of Hippocrates. And what's interesting about it is that it disconnects divine intervention and instead uses a method that tries to find a cause and effect between nature and the physiology of the individual. 
To treat a headache, some Romans would seek out an elephant and try to get it to put their trunk on their head. Why? I don't really know, and I don't want to get into the madness of it all. Of course, I'm not saying that Roman medicine was void of misunderstandings and things that we now know were completely wrong, but to use an example as, as that of sleeping with the trunk of an elephant to relieve headache, that does not represent Roman medicine or the, their methodology. In fact, that's mentioned in the Naturalis Historia by uh, Pliny, and he speaks of it with skepticism. So it's more of a superstition. Of course they wouldn't have a modern understanding, but you shouldn't really underestimate how much knowledge someone like Galenus, who could practice surgery in the gladiatorial field, how much he understood wounds. Since in his writing he mentions things such as the fact that certain types of lesion to the external nerves of the spinal cord can generate insensitivity in the part of the chest situated underneath the wound. And several of his theories, which have been studied in detail, have been considered to be correct even under our own modern scientific understanding. The guy was a visionary. Hygiene. Now I've touched upon it lightly before, but make no mistake that there's a reason that people died very young in the ancient days. It was considered a miracle if you even lived to old age by how we define it now. And the reason that they kept dying young is that they've misunderstood the world and many of the processes by which you can actually get sick and die, such as not having proper hygiene. For example, you might know about the legendary and infamous Roman bathing houses. These were structures for Romans to bathe in a communal fashion. For the commoners of Rome, they had to go to a public bathhouse to bathe amongst each other. It's not really hard to imagine all the things that could go wrong with such a practice. Not that ancient Rome really cared. They thought it was such a great idea that they constructed massive bathhouses to hold more people and even made them very artistic. However, as you may have also guessed, these bathhouses were not exactly the cleanest things around. With so many people in them, they would have needed to change the water quite a bit to keep them clean, but it turns out they probably didn't do that all so much. So in those waters, you'd find anything from dirt to oil, things like mildews and bacterias and even literal feces. Okay, I'll give you that most likely the sort of hygiene or hygienic conditions of Roman baths wouldn't really be up to standard in our modern time, but saying that that's because they didn't have an overall understanding of the concept of transmission of diseases is, is wrong. It's more of a problem of administrative nature. So yeah, they didn't really bother to change the water or clean them as much as they should have, but if we read the sources, we see that they very very much know that that could be a dangerous situation when it comes to a possible contagious event. Let's read it. Celsus, for example, writes that the worst thing you can do when you have a wound that hasn't completely healed yet is to go to the Roman baths because it would render the wound wet and dirty, which can make it rot. This author also tells us that as he's teaching us how to take care of several possible conditions, whether it be wounds, whether it be all sorts of problems, he tells us how to do your bandages right, and he says if you do it right, then you don't have to worry about those becoming loose when you go to the bath. Also, as we read the Historia Augusta, we see that Emperor Claudius was worried about sick individuals going to the Roman baths and even institutes regulations and laws whereby people who were sick were only allowed to go to the bath in certain specific time frames in order to keep them separated from the rest of the population. Gladiatrix. There aren't even records of them being trained in gladiator combat, which might have meant that they were literally thrown in to die without even an attempt to give them a chance at survival. The reason this is both creepy and sad is that there have been plenty of female warriors throughout history, and women have proven to be just as strong, if not stronger, than men when allowed the chance to prove themselves. Okay, this statement is, an, I don't know, some sort of fan service. Is that what your subscribers want to hear? I, I don't know. But this idea of women are stronger than men in combat, and basically it's the patriarchy that they didn't allow them to fight. Well, first of all, let, let's be honest about this. What sort of combat are we talking about? Because if we're talking about armed combat, so if you, if you give a man a sword, and you give a woman a sword, and they're both relatively trained, then weapons are great equalizers. But 
when we look in general, and particularly in the classical period, there is a reason why it was mostly men to go to war, and that is because in general men tend to be larger and stronger when co and also more aggressive than women. But I'm not gonna go into the details because I already have a dedicated video, link in the description. I'm just saying the statement on its own sounds like a form of pandering really. The death of slaves, crucifixion. While many may think that this was reserved for certain kinds of criminals, for slaves it was done for almost any reason that you could imagine. If they had committed any kind of crime, or even a perceived crime, they would be put to the cross, and yet it was done virtually all the time. When it comes to crucifixion, it's absolutely not true that the Romans would just use it. You know, if you were a slave, oh, they would just crucify you for, for nothing. That is absolutely not true. The sources say that, yes, crucifixion was used against non-citizen, but for two specific types of criminals, rebels and bandits. So no, they weren't just crucifying any slave they wanted. Incitatus. This one is almost too funny to mention, but I have to talk about it because it will just seem too insane. However, it's not. Anyway, in Rome, there was apparently an emperor who was so fond of his horse that he decided to try and make it a consul. However, there are some accounts that state the horse never even existed in the first place, or that it's simply a legend that was exaggerated so that the stupidity of certain leadership could be expressed amongst the people. All right, this is another myth. The idea that Caligula was so crazy that he tried to nominate his horse, Inquitatus, as a senator has been debunked. Uh, there is a mention in the sources of this speech and this situation, but it is now interpreted as one of two things. Either it's a complete fabrication trying to speak badly and discredit the imperial figure of Caligula to just speak badly about people. But the one explanation that I ascribe to is the fact that Caligula knew exactly what he was doing. When he said that, it was his way to say, okay, you senatorial class are so useless now that even an animal could be a senator. So it's an insult to the senatorial class. That's how I interpret it. Slavery, what it was like to be a slave in ancient Rome. Much like many other cultures, slaves were not viewed as human, they were viewed simply as property, and that meant that their owners could do pretty much anything they wanted to them by law, and nothing could be protested. Okay, I already have a problem with the first point, in the sense that it's true, yeah, the Romans even went as far as calling the slaves instrumentum vocale, which basically means a tool with a voice. With that being said, this idea that they could do anything they wanted to them without any legal repercussion, depending on what era we are looking at, is completely wrong. Seneca and Pliny tell us about, for example, how Velius would punish his slaves in atrocious ways, but these sort of very cruel attitudes are always stigmatized and spoken badly in the sources. Not to mention during the reign of Emperor Augustus, the so-called Lex Petronia was passed, according to which the owners were prohibited to send their slaves to fight wild beasts in the arena without a notary authorization. And the deeper we go into the Roman legal code, Code, the more we see that more and more rights were created for these type of people. For example, Emperor Claudius says that if you abandon one of your slaves because they are injured or maybe they're ill and you don't want to sustain the costs of that, then that man automatically becomes free. Moreover, Suetonius tells us that if that man, the owner, decides to kill his slave because they are injured or ill, it's considered homicide. So yeah, they couldn't do whatever they wanted. The very early original power over life and death over your slaves is even further limited by Antoninus Pius, who established that if a man killed his slave with no sufficient reason, which is sine causa in Roman law, he would be punished according to those laws that deal with what happens when you kill someone else's slave, which is a criminal offence. And still Antoninus Pius creates another law that enforces the following. If a Roman man was particularly cruel towards one of his slaves, he could be forced by law to sell that slave to another person. So once again, depending on the era in Rome, if you're cruel to your slaves, you'll lose them. All right, Noble Ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet a member of this community, become a Noble One. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. <laughs>